Um, one of the things which really surprised me working in West Kalimantan and particularly in the district of Sangal was that in spite of the fact that you had um, in 2009 the most oil palm, the most rubber of any district in the province, that still this was the highest area of food insecurity, the highest district. And I was trying to work out why that should be. And it seems that a lot of the people who were food insecure were not necessarily owners of land, smallholders, but they were people who worked as laborers, who had, been, who had sold their land or been displaced from their land. And so didn't actually have the land resources to be able to continue. And I think the basic thing that struck me, and I've been working in Sangal now for quite a long time, um, was the tremendous variety. Um, you had fantastic resources in some areas, amazing DIAC systems which were continuing with their forests where they plant a lot of trees, have great access to fruits, vegetables from the forests, all of those things, as well as their own rice and rubber. Those systems were continuing, in some cases with a bit of oil palm, and in other cases they have been completely taken over by oil palm and the people had lost all those extra resources. So even though they might have still owned land, if the price of oil palm went down, then they also would become quite vulnerable. And this was what seemed to be happening. And I was concerned, I was staying in a Dyak longhouse just recently, um, I was concerned about the fact that although they still kept all of these resources, um, they were not in fact using them very much. They were in fact buying Indomie and using uh, these kinds of foods which were not very sustainable and uh, they had marvellous fruits and vegetables in the fields around them and in the forests around them which they still maintained. But there was this process of Indomieisation which I think has become quite common throughout Indonesia, both with the middle classes and even in, in a lot in the rural areas, of not actually utilising the marvellous resources which are around them and still exist, despite of, in spite of oil palm and in spite of everything else, these resources are still there in the environment. Compared with Brazil, where um, again you have the forest, but they were utilising so many of the forest resources now. Um, and in many cases, these are unique forest resources, unique forest products which grow in the Amazon, but they are utilising them very much in their, in their own society. And now some of them, like acai, have become really well known throughout the world as very good products with a lot of vitamins and so on. And the forests where one is producing acai have now expanded because it's become such an important product and so good nutritionally. Um, so that, you know, there are products in Kalimantan, for example, lots of different sorts of durian, lots of different sorts of mangoes. They're, they're world endemism sites for these kinds of products. You get enormous variety and yet they're not really being utilised because there's not mar no market for them at the moment. And that is the problem of trying to build up markets for some of these other very useful forest products which people can eat. Um, so this I think is one of the questions. You can, you can get in the forest you can find vegetables, for example, you can find all sorts of ferns and, and leaves and things like that which, which are edible, um, as well as fruits, many forest fruits. Um, and uh, those things are there in the forest, but then if you destroy the forest, if you cut it all down and turn it into an oil palm plantation, um, very often if you're a small holder with a company, they won't allow you to grow anything else on the land, they just want you to plant oil palm. So that then you don't have a chance to buy, to make your own food, to get your food from the forest anymore. The forest is gone. You have to buy it. And of course, it's all fine if the price of oil palm is high, you can go and you can buy your food. But once that price goes down, then you get into serious problems. And, uh, you know, in 2009, there was a huge crash of oil palm and rubber prices, both of these great commodities which were so important. Um, and at that stage, the government was saying people should get more into mixed cultivation, they should be growing their own food more, but then there wasn't all that much land left in some places for doing that. Now, there's much more oil palm in many of these areas. There's much less rice production, and uh, 
the price of oil palm was going down, of palm oil was going down during the last year. People were again getting worried. Um, and so, you know, it is very much reliant on the international market. And people's nutrition depends a lot on the relative prices of things like rice, vegetables, if they're for sale, where are they? Sometimes you can't find them. You know, in some parts of Indonesia, it's very difficult to find vegetables um, because everything is oil palm. And otherwise you can find rice, but this may not be very good rice and it could be quite expensive. So relative prices now become very important and people's nutrition depends on those things. And, uh, you know, if they earn reasonable incomes, okay, they can cope with this. But if they're in a, in a situation whereby maybe they don't know, have no longer any land or they are only having employment every so often, not, not full-scale employment, if they're working on a plantation for low wages, these sorts of things become extremely important. And that's the problem. So they probably then just eat noodles. And uh, that's not entirely the case, of course. That's exaggerating. But at the same time, there is this tendency to go for cheap foods which don't have much nutrition. And that, that becomes a serious problem as far as the society is concerned.